There is nothing that we cannot conquer because we know he's faithful. We know he's worthy. We know that he is holy. There is no one like him. Amen. So if we just meditate on that. We can get past us. We can get past what we're going through. Come on, let's give him some praise in this place. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give him some glory. We can do better than that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He deserves the glory. He deserves the honor. He deserves all of the praise. Hallelujah. Do y'all know that some of us, when we went clubbing, as they say, we wanted people to know we were in the house. Some of you, before you left home, you got your moves together. You got your uh, shouts together. You got everything together. Even your clothes was together. So whichever way you turned, somebody saw you. Is that not right? But we have learned that it's not about us. It's all about him. So if we come in the house of God, before we get in here, we should already have a praise. We shouldn't wait on nobody to stir us up. We should already be stirred up in him. When you're at home and you think about where you were and where you are now, when you think about how you were in pain, and you don't have that pain now? Come on, you should be praising him. You should be giving him glory. Because God is just that good. Some of us did not know how we was going to make it on yesterday. Don't even know how we were going to make it today. But guess what? We're here. We're here. And we're here because of him. Not because of us. It's all about him. And when we begin to lift him up and glorify him, that's when the presence of the Lord began to come in the room. And whatever you're going through, you can feel his peace, even in the midst of your storm. Does anybody know what God's peace is? It's a peace that passes all understanding. It's a peace that guards your heart and your mind in him. That's the kind of peace. But that peace don't come until we do the first part. Be anxious for nothing. But through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. See, that's where we miss it. We got to turn everything over to him. We got to give it to him. Your hurts, your pains, your disappointment. You got to roll it over to him. He said, when you commit your works unto me and trust in me, he said, your thoughts shall be established. So we have to commit unto him. We have to roll it over unto who? Unto him. So I'm going to say before we get into this word, let go. Let go. I want you to understand if you haven't fixed it yet, it is not for you to fix. It's for you to understand that it's already been fixed. It's already been worked out. So quit trying to figure it out and know that God has already worked it out. And when you know he's already worked it out, you can begin to give him a shout. You can begin to give him glory. Don't wait on. Don't wait on for it to be worked out. Know that it's already worked out. That's when you begin to praise him. Don't praise him when it looked like you want it to look. Praise him in the midst of the way it's looking. Just give him glory. Give him honor. Because God is worthy. Amen. He is worthy. Father, we thank you. We honor you. We glorify you on today. God, without you, God, we would be nothing. So, Father God, we commit and we roll everything over to you today. And we thank you for our teacher, our helper. We thank you for the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we need your assistance today. We need your help. We cannot do it by ourselves. So, Father, I thank you that I have been, not going to be, but I have been crucified with Christ. 
And it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And I thank you that you have given me the tongue of the learned, that I may speak a word in season to those that are weary. Thank you that you waketh me morning by morning to hear as one being taught, one that's being learned by you, God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God, that you have already filled my mouth, God, with what you will have for me to say unto your people. I thank you, Father God, that the Holy Spirit is illuminating this word today, where it's penetrating our very being. And by it penetrating our very being, God, as I speak, it is coming out of my mouth like a fire, and it's devouring everything going on around us. Father God, it's coming out of my mouth like a hammer, and it's breaking the rocks into pieces, God, on today. So we thank you and we praise you, God. For your word on today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Open your Bibles to 1 Kings, the 13th chapter. Last week we were talking about are you raptured ready? And I believe this teaching here is going to um, go a along with a little bit of what we was talking about last week. But on being raptured ready, I was so excited about that teaching because... God wants us to be ready for his return. And we don't know the day nor the hour when he's coming. He can come like a thief in the night. So our bags have to always be packed because we need to have an expectancy of his return. Don't be listening to people and, and they telling you he's coming back today. No, you need to be ready regardless of what people say. Amen. You need to be ready for his return. And why? Because he don't want us to be left behind for the wrath that's coming the ones that's being caught up and raptured up into heaven will be there for seven years and we won't be going through the tribulation i don't want nobody to be left here doing the tribulation time because if you don't take that mark of the beast then they will kill you and if they kill you before you accept this gospel that will be preached then guess where you're going Everybody know where they're going. And when you go to that place, the maggots and the worms don't even die. They burn forever and ever and ever. And you are aware of what's going on, but you will not be saved from it. That's why Jesus came, to give us the good news so we can accept him, so we can be a part of this kingdom and what God has already done for us through Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's look at 1 um, Kings, the 13th chapter. And I'm just going to read um, a portion of it, and I'm going to go back to verse 1. I want you to look at uh, verse 7, well, verse 6, 1 Kings 13, verse 6. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it, as it was before. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me, and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. I want to talk about don't get off course. Don't get off course. And when we look at a course, it's a path or direction that someone or something is going to. It is a path or direction someone or something is going to. So God is bringing this word to say, don't get off course. There are many things that will take us off the course that God has for us to be on, for the path or the direction that God has for us to go. Don't let things take you out of position. Don't let things take you from the place that God have you in. See, what the enemy want to do, he want to take you out of that place because he know where his place is his place is hell so he want to take people where he is going he already know his destiny he know his path but he want to deter us and take us off the path that god has for us when you go back to the beginning you see how adam and eve they were in paradise they were in a good place but the enemy came in with deception 
And he deceived Eve. And by him deceiving Eve, Eve deceived, well, actually, she didn't deceive her husband because her husband already knew the truth. So the husband began to listen to his wife, and they got kicked out of what? Paradise. I'm saying kicked out. They were sent out of paradise. And the reason why God sent them out is because he did not want them to live forever in sin. He wanted them to have life and have life more abundantly without being in that sinful state. So God is saying, don't get off course. I want to encourage you because some things in our lives would take us out of the place or take us from the direction that God have us to be in. If you own a job and you're going through on your job or if you're in a marriage and you're going through whatever place that you're in and you know that's what God is telling you, you don't move by your circumstances. God said it's too many people moving by what they hear, moving by how they feel, moving by their five senses. God said, I only want you to be moved by the spirit. You can't be moved by how your flesh feel because our flesh feel different um, ways on different days. I don't know about you. One minute my flesh may feel this way. The next day it's feeling that way. And then you're trying to figure out what's going on. Don't be emotionalized. Be spiritualized. That's what God is saying. Don't be emotionalized. Be spiritualized. And the only way you can be that way is through the word of God. And as I was praying, I'm like, okay, God, you say be raptured ready. You want all of us to be ready for the coming of the Lord. But then the Lord said, if they don't stay on course, they're not going to be ready for his coming. Because they're going to be doing things that they should not be doing when it's time for him to come. God said, I want their hearts already always prepared for my coming. I want their hearts to always have an expectancy. And the only way you can do this is staying on course. You cannot lose focus. I know we got athletes up in here. They can't lose focus playing football, playing basketball, because they're out to win. So their focus has to be on that win. Their focus has to be on getting to that finish line, wherever it may be, a runner. Their focus is on getting to the finish line. They ain't over here trying to worry about what this one is doing or what that one is doing. They're looking straight ahead because they want to get to the end. And this is what God is saying. He said, church folks are losing focus. They're not staying on course. One thing will change your course. When somebody says something wrong to you, it's changed your course. When you don't, you having a bad day, it changed your course. But with whatever God has given you, your choice should not change. Your course should not change. You may waver in that thing, but you getting back on track and saying, God, this is what you said. I have um, faltered over here, but I'm getting up, God, and I'm going to stay on course. I may not be where I need to be, but through the help of the Holy Spirit, God, I'm going to get where you will have for me to be. So when you look in this passage of scripture, it's a lot going on here because um, the man that he was talking to, when you go back to 1 Kings 13 chapter, his name was Jeroboam. And what was happening with Jeroboam, and I'm going to have to give you a little bit of history so you'll know what's going on. Jeroboam, he had um, 10 tribes. And how he got these 10 tribes was we got to go back to Solomon. And Solomon didn't stay on course, y'all. Solomon did what Solomon chose to do outside of what God told him to do. I'm going to have to, you know, it says Solomon was the wisest man. Evidently, he lost something because he didn't stay on course the way God wanted him on course. Y'all remember Solomon was David's son, and he was the next one that was going to take the throne. And when he did take the throne, he began to pray to the Lord with all of his heart, and God heard his heart. He said, I don't know how to judge these people. He said, I don't know how to go in. I don't know how to come out. He said, God, give me a heart that would be able to discern between good and evil. So God heard his heart. Solomon didn't ask for riches. Only thing he asked was, God, help me to know how to be a king to these people that I need to be. So I need wisdom. And God began to tell Solomon, because you didn't ask for riches, Because you didn't ask for this. He said, I'm not only going to give you this wisdom. I'm going to give you basically riches on top of what you ask. Because God knew Solomon's heart. 
And as Solomon began to grow before the Lord, he was giving people wisdom outside of his years. It was coming from God. It wasn't coming from Solomon. But then Solomon, the, the more he got higher and higher and higher. See, this is the problem with the people of God. You may start out one way, but sometimes you end up another way because when you let all of these things come in and be your influence, you forgot where you're from. See, what happened to Solomon he had all this wisdom. People knew how wise he was. But then Solomon had so much riches, so many things. And guess what? The thing that he wanted was more women. And wasn't it he had 700, was it wives or concubines? It was one of them. But he had, a, who in the world need all these women? First of all, you got to have the strength of God to have all these women. But what he did was he ended up living up to what these women wanted. They served different gods. So he was trying to serve those gods with those women. But he knew what the word of God said. I'm going somewhere. Even though he knew what the word of God said, he wanted to do what his wives wanted him to do. We're going back to the beginning with Adam. Adam knew what the word of God said. He told Solomon, as long as you serve me, as long as you obey my commands, he would steady be on that throne because he had a covenant with David. But then Solomon got out of the way because of these women. He was trying to please these women by, you know, putting up these um, high places, serving these other gods. So we're getting back to Jeroboam. This is what happened. Solomon actually brought Jeroboam in because he was, uh, had uh, some kind of skill, so Solomon was using him. But when Solomon began to cut up with the Lord, the Lord began to tell Ahijah, which was a prophet, he said, I want you to speak unto Jeroboam. Jeroboam, and I want you to let him know he's going to be the one that take these 10 tribes. And the reason why is because Solomon disobeyed what I required of Solomon. I'm going to leave him too because of the covenant that I had with David. So when he told Solomon this, Solomon was trying to kill Jeroboam. Come on, we got people in the house of God trying to kill one another because you've been disobedient to what God told you. Now God said, I can't trust you with that, so I'm going to give it to somebody else, but I'm still going to stick to my promises, but you can't carry out that. Oh, I know God is talking in the place. See, we get mad when somebody else move further than you. And you trying to figure out, I've been here all of these years. I did this. I served in this position. Why am I back down here? Because you're not doing what God has required you to do. And his kingdom is going to move forward with or without you. Some people think you can't do it without me. Look at your neighbor and say, the devil is a lie. Say, it ain't about you says about the king of kings and the lord of lords say if it was about you we would have died a long time ago come on give god some praise so god is saying don't let people take you off course to what god has given you to what god has placed in your hands so this was told to Jeroboam. Solomon got mad and he began to seek out Jeroboam to kill him. Jeroboam went to Egypt and he stayed in Egypt until Solomon died. When Solomon died, Rehoboam, which is his son, took his place. And when he took his place, Rehoboam was not preparing his heart to seek God the way he need to. This is what happened. When Solomon was in, in, in place before he died, he was putting taxes on the people so much that the people couldn't bear it. And the reason why Solomon was doing it is because of his lifestyle. See, when we get so far up there, and I have to go somewhere with church folks, you got pastors getting so far up there with their lifestyles, and in order to keep those lifestyles, they put a burden on the people of God. I say it again. You get pastors living these luxury lifestyles and saying, this is what God is telling us to do. Well, if God is telling you to do it, you don't have to beg people to get what you got. 
because God is going to turn their hearts towards you so you will be able to keep what God has given you. You don't have to depend on man because God will turn the man's hearts towards you. So you got pastors living these lifestyles and expecting for the people to keep up with these lifestyles so they end up putting more on the people and it become a burden. And God don't want you to be burdened with anything or anybody. This is why Miracle Temple, if you haven't caught on yet, something is wrong, you ain't in your word. Everything we do, we say give from the heart. There is no amount on nothing. So nobody ain't making you do nothing. You already know where your heart is. If you got a dollar heart, lay down the dollar. If you got a 50 cent heart, lay down the 50 cent. Because if you lay down a thou and your heart ain't where the thousand is, you ain't getting rewarded from it. You just lost a thousand dollars. I know I'm preaching up in here. So nobody can say me and my husband is trying to put burdens on you so we can live a lifestyle. Because my lifestyle is in Christ. And whatever I need in him, I move. In him, I have my being. So everything I need is in him. So if you change your mind and get off course, I'm still keeping the course that God has put me on. I'm going to stay where God wants me to stay. So they were putting the, Solomon put these burdens on the people. So Rehoboam, his son, why is it that somebody will come in the house, put the burden on the people, somebody will take charge after that person die. Now they got to try to keep up with what this person left. This is why God told Joshua, Moses is dead. Now I want you to take these people over the Jordan. It ain't about Moses no more. Moses done done what I told Moses to do. Now I want you to take these people. So this is what happened. Rehoboam went to the wisest men. These wise men were older men. And these men would give counsel. They would sit before Solomon. So they would tell Solomon different things. So he went before these men, and this is what he said when the men told him, humble yourself before them. This is what it takes, humility. Basically what he was saying, listen to them. You know, it, we're getting in a place that we want to be heard, but we don't want to listen. So he said, okay, I'll, I'll come back to you within three days. By that time, Jeroboam had come back in the place. But then after the elder, the older men told him that, he had novice. Right. Let me talk about the novice in the place. We got novice that think that they, they know more than people that's been in ministry for years. We got novice that don't even take time to go in the word, to dissect the word. We got novice trying to do like people on TV, trying to hoop, trying to holler, live in any kind of way, trying to give somebody some advice. So these were novice, the ones that grew up with Rehoboam, and they're going to tell them, him, put more pressure on them. Make the yoke even harder. The way your daddy whooped them, whoop them even harder. You scorpions in the, in the word of God. So guess what he did? He took the advice of novice. See, we got novice in the house of God. We got novice that think that they know more than the one that God has put in charge. We got novice that don't show up till they want to show up. They don't want to sing till they want to sing. We got novice that always want to preach, always want to teach, but don't want to lay down their life for nobody, thinking that everybody's supposed to look up to them. But he took the advice of the novice. When he took the, the advice of the novice, they began to rebel against this man. They didn't want to have nothing to do with Rehoboam. So they were siding with who? Jeroboam. And at this time, this is what happened. We see that Jeroboam, he had the ten tribes. When he had those ten tribes, let me tell you what he did. Now, he did some crooked stuff too because he's supposed to have been leading the people the right way. But Rehoboam was so mad, he said, we're going to go in and we're going to take over these tribes that Jeroboam had. And God said, tell them. They're not going to fight with them. Go back to your place. They went back to their place. But this is what Jeroboam did. Jeroboam began to say, these people, what they're going to do, they're going to have to come up to Jerusalem to worship because they had a place of worship. 
They're going to have to come up to worship. And I don't want the people going back to Rehoboam. Don't we have this in the church? Oh, help me, somebody. See, Jeroboam didn't want to do right because he was afraid the 10 tribes that I have, they got to go past a certain place. And if they go past that certain place, they're going to end up going back over here where they left. So I'm going to fix it. I'm going to make them molding images where they can worship where they are and they don't have to go back to where they were. Oh, I'm talking. Because we got church folks out of line. Got a place of worship the way God wants you to worship. But the enemy is trying to take you off course and making you feel like this place is better. This is what you need to do. So this is what they begin to do, and they begin to set up altars. Jeroboam did. And when he began to set up these altars, they begin to go back into idolatry. This was one thing God said, don't you do. What am I telling you? When you know what the word of God is saying, you shouldn't be caught up somewhere that ain't teaching truth. I don't care how good the place look. I don't care how nice they treat you. If truth is in the house, you don't need to be in the house. If they're outside of the will of God, you need to leave the premises because that ain't God at work. But this is what um, Jeroboam did. So now I'm back to where I was to make you to help you to understand why this man of God was asked to restore back his hand. The reason why, because he was at this very place worshiping other gods that he should not have been worshiping. And this prophet began to prophesy to him and tell him what was going to happen. He got mad at the prophet and he said, go get that prophet. And he couldn't touch the prophet. And that's what happened to his hand. But the prophet had to end up praying for him. So I caught you up there to go here. Once that prophet done what God had sent him to do, he said, don't you go back the way you came. Don't you eat. Don't you drink with nobody. Because he was carrying the word of the Lord. Y'all got to hear this. When God give you something, when he put a word in your belly, God put that word in your belly to be delivered where he will have that word to be delivered. God said, I don't want you to look to the left nor to your right. I don't even want you to go to your mom and daddy house. I want you to go where I'm telling you to go. And I don't want you to open your mouth until I tell you to open your mouth. Why? Because he know along the way, you're going to have people to take you off course. You're going to have people to, to try to tell you you this and you that. Why you ain't doing this and why you ain't doing that. Why your pastor got you sitting here all this long time. You should be preaching. You should be teaching. You should be singing. You should be doing this. No, you should be being taught. Because if you ain't going out, being a disciple, why you want to come in here and teach somebody? When you can't even give salvation to a fly, why you want to come in here and tell somebody about the goodness of Jesus? Everybody want to stand behind the pulpit, but when you get your opportunity, you fail because that ain't where God wants you to be at that time. So he's trying to spare you. He's trying to get you ready. For where he's carrying you. God did not put me behind the pulpit when he said, you a pastor. He did not put me behind the pulpit when he said, you an evangelist. He didn't put me behind the pulpit when he said, you a prophet. He definitely didn't put me there when he said I was an apostle. He was making me ready for where he was taking me. And through making me ready, he had to see if I was going to stand through sickness. He had to see if I was going to stand through not having enough. He had to see if I was going to stand when people talked about me, ridiculed me. He had to test me to see if I would trust him and keep the course outside of man. Some of y'all don't keep the course because you're worrying about what she said. Or nobody giving me nothing. Oh, it's quiet up in here. You get upset because the one you became friends with in church, in church, don't want to be your friend no more. They taking somebody else out to eat. They ain't take, wait a minute, y'all, what is, what, is this a club, a social club, or is this the house of God? He have no respectable person. He reigned on the just as well as the unjust. We have.
have an elite corner in churches? Do we have the money corner? The ones that are elite, the ones with money, we treat them better than we treat other people. That's wrong. We, we let them do what they want to do as long as they fill in the basket up. I don't work like that. If you don't put nothing in that basket, I'm staying the course. And you got to stay the course no matter who stick with you. You got to stay the course on what God say, not what man is saying. If man is saying something that don't line up with the word that God put in your belly, you don't accept that word. You reject it. And say that's not what God said. So this man of God, this prophet, he told a man what God said. He went another way. But I'm here to tell y'all, this is how cutting the enemy is. When you got a word in your belly and that word is going to save somebody's life. When that word is going to heal, deliver, and set the captives free. Y'all don't know the enemy going to steal the word. Read your word. The Bible say he come to steal, kill, and what? So you don't think that the word that's in your belly, you don't think that it's precious. You don't think the enemy want to take it before it get rooted. This is why when you're sitting in here right now, the enemy is ready to snatch that word so you can't go home and get back in that word and meditate on that word and say, God, what are you saying to me? God, what would you have me to do with the word that apostle preached today? God, you didn't bring that word in the house for no reason. Some people always waiting on somebody to say, oh, you're going to get a car. Oh, you're going to get this. Oh, God is saying this. But when you in your word, if they say nothing, you know what God has already said. Because you in the word, you in a relationship with God. So this man didn't go the way that he needed to go. He, the way that uh, Jeroboam wanted him to go. And guess what? He put a reward in there. Come on, people, when it comes to money... You get off course quick. I give you $5,000 if you just come over here to our church and do what we want you to do over here. I give you $5,000 a month just to play them drums. Pastor, I believe the Lord is telling me it's time. Did God tell you that or that $5,000 told you that? Oh, my goodness. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Money talk. The love of money will talk. And the enemy will talk to you too. But this man of God, when Jeroboam said, I will give you a reward, this man let him know, basically paraphrasing it, if you gave me all of this, I'm still not going to do what you will have me to do. I'm not going outside the word. He didn't take the reward. It goes back to Gehazi, the one that followed Elijah. And look what he done. Elisha wouldn't take from this man of God. He wouldn't take from Naaman. Why? Because he said, I don't want you to say that money is what healed you. It is God that healed you. He wouldn't take it from him. But Gehazi said, I'll take it. He didn't keep the course. He let money be his God. Some of us in this room right now, if someone, I'm just going to be perfectly honest with you, if somebody offered you something to go somewhere else, you will think about it. <laughs> Apostle ain't gave me nothing all these years. I've been up in Miracle Temple. She ain't been giving me nothing. It's all about her and her husband. At least they're thinking about me. They're going to give me a little something, something. I need some more income. Yeah, I go. <laughs> yes, she will. Just like that. Snap of a finger. I ain't going to see you no more. God's bringing it in the house. Why is he bringing it in the house? Because the enemy is trying to take people out of place. So this man of God, he continued to travel. But remember, he was carrying the word of God. Let me put this out here, y'all. How many know God's word don't change? Hold it before you answer that. Let's just stop. Let's just cut it out. We're going to repent right now. Lord Jesus, repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus. I heard what she said, but Lord, I know that in my life that I have strayed from your word, even though it don't change. Now, let me go back to the text and say it again. We say God's word don't change, right? We say God's word don't change. The Bible said he's the same today, yesterday, 
and forever, right? The word of God said, my covenant will I not break nor alter the things that have come out of my what? Mouth, out of my lips. Is that not his word? Then he goes on to say, God is not man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he shall repent. Repent means I don't change my mind. Have I not? Shall I not? Have I not? Shall I not? Who is God depending on him? He said, because I'm God and not man that I should lie. So we say God don't change. But as soon as God tell us, I am supplying all of your needs according to my riches and glory through Christ Jesus. When our needs are not met, we say, God, what happened? If you know he don't change, why are you asking him what happened? Let me say it again. When your money acts a little funny and you begin to quote God's word and then you question God on his word, you calling him a lie. Did ding, did a light come on for somebody? Or when you're going through in your body and the pain seems like it won't ease up and you're saying bye, his stripes, I was already here, but seemed like you still hurting. Then you question God and say, God, why ain't you healed me? But you say it don't change. So why we question him? Why we go back and ask God like God is a liar? Going back to what Balaam was saying to Balak. See, you got to understand what the word is saying before you present the word. You got to go in there and study this word out to know where all of this is coming from. How did Balaam end up with saying God is not man? Because God put his words in his mouth and said, you're only going to speak what I tell you to speak. So by him putting the words in his mouth, he said, how can I curse something that God has already blessed? He's not going to reverse it. So this is what happened, y'all. Balaam knew God don't change his mind. Whatever God say is what it's going to be. Now, here's how Balaam got off course from what God, he was doing everything God told him to do, just like some of us. But he knew God don't change his mind. So you know what he did? He showed Balak how to get them to sin. God may not change his word, but this is what you can do. To make the people fall. Come on, y'all. It's all in the church. All in the church. God ain't going to change his mind, but somebody in the house of God is going to show somebody how to do something outside of what God's word tells them to do. That's what happened to Balaam. He told the people, how Balak, Balak, how to get the people to start committing these sins outside of what God told them to do. So he was still in fault. It looked like Balaam was following God. Y'all better know who you following. Y'all better know who giving you advice. Because I ain't letting nobody give me advice that's living out of what God says. You cannot tell me something and your household tore up. You cannot tell me what God is saying and your house is tore up. Mm -mm. Because God's word is still the same. Even Joshua told them, you can serve these gods over here, the Amorites, or the ones that's on the other side. But I'm here to tell you today, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You choose this day whom you're going to serve. Because Joshua said, I'm staying on course. You do what you want to do, but you ain't doing it up in my house. Because I'm staying on course. But we always hollering, Lord, Lord, but we ain't doing what he said. We always telling somebody, this is what God said. But guess what? You allowing mess to go in your house. Did his word change outside of what you said? It don't work like that. So this is what happened to Balaam. He didn't stay on course. He found the way the enemy used him. 
But then we go back to Jeroboam. Jeroboam tried to give him a reward. He wouldn't take it. Y'all, the enemy is always looking for an opening to make you fall. The higher you go in God, he's looking for loopholes, people. When you think that you got it, you ain't got it. That's why you got to stay in prayer with God and say, God, show me loopholes in my life. Show me weak areas in my life that the enemy is watching. Show me these weak areas, God, so I can build them up in the word. Show me, God, how to shut my mouth when I need to shut my mouth. Show me how, God, to turn the other cheek when I need to turn the other cheek. Because you may be perfected here, but you ain't perfected here. And the areas that you're not perfected in, you got to pull back from people in those areas until you get perfected. Because it'll take you off course to where God want to carry you. So this is what happened. The man of God, he kept on going. But then there was another prophet. And he had two, I believe it was sons in that same chapter. And those sons went back and was telling what this prophet done. And they was, they was telling what this prophet done. They, their daddy, which was a prophet, went to this man of God. And he went to the man of God and he began to talk to him. And he said, I'm a prophet. Oh, I'm going somewhere with this. Everybody that say they is ain't. That's why you got to know who is and who ain't. And the only way you would know it is through the Holy Spirit. So he said, I'm a prophet, and an angel spoke to me. And this angel told me for you to come home and eat with me and drink with me and sit at my table. Do you know this prophet that just told Jeroboam that the Lord told me not to eat nor drink or go the same way I came? He's going to change his mind because this man said he was a prophet. And he heard from God. I want to tell y'all something. We got a lot of people that say in their prophets. And already got a word from the Lord at what God said. Then another false prophet show up in your life and say, God said, you supposed to be doing this at this time. But God already told you several months ago, I'm the potter. You are the clay. I'm molding you and shaping you into the image I would have for you to be. He said, I want you to wait on your ministry. I want you to get taught until I release you from where I have put you. But I don't want you to be deceived by nobody. Just got the word. Now, here come another prophet saying, God is saying to you today. That it's time for you to preach. You got the word in your belly. For some reason, your pastor got you sitting down. And you're sitting down dying. And it's just bothering your flesh so much. But God say, rise up. And he's going to send you to a place where you can proclaim his word. And you can proclaim his gospel. And I know this is God. Is it God? That's what this prophet did. How can God give you a word and tell you, stand still? Then somebody else come and tell you to get up. (laughs) Who's telling the truth? If you say you know God, how can one minute you testify in one thing, the next minute it's another? God don't, let me tell y'all something, quit making excuses for God. If God say he's a healer, that's what he is. If your healing ain't manifested, quit making an excuse for why it ain't manifested. God said it. It don't matter if you look deformed and everything else. That's what he said and that's what he meant. God is going to be God outside of what it looked like. He's just going to see, can you still trust me? Even when it ain't looking right, can you still stand up and say, I'm healed and you're looking deformed? People are saying you're lying. But that ain't what God is saying. See, that's how we miss it. The enemy is a deceiver. He's a trickster, people. He wants you to get off course. He wants you to feel like this is your time. But if you ain't doing what you're supposed to do with what God has given you, you think God's going to promote you? God don't work like that. God gets you fine-tuned. God allow you. To, to, he, he scripts you. 
to get you ready for where he's carrying you. I don't care how good you know the word. Uh Uh-uh. You can know the word. You can quote those scriptures, tell people where they are. But if you ain't living them in the times of trouble, God say you ain't ready yet. You ain't ready for that yet. I'm reminded. Y'all, God got me on these movies and he helped me to find them. And I do have the name of this one. So Holy Spirit, help me to remember when I get through telling it. God always set me up. Rick, he sought me up. I was looking at this movie the other night, y'all. And at first, you know, some movies don't really interest you, but it was just like, no, stay there. There was a family, a brother. He was getting ready to graduate high school. A little girl, she was about 10. It was a mother and father. All the children heard was their parents fussing all the time. And the mother was telling the dad, you need to go find a job. So he found one, but it was going to be in another city. So the mom said, he's going um, to this other city, but he's going to send us money. Now the son, he was already washing dishes and bringing money in the house because they didn't have food. So he would go buy grocery or ask for an advance on his paycheck, and he would come home and he would give his mom and dad the money. So that night he gave the mom $40, and that helped them to get a little bit of grocery. Then the next thing that had happened at school, they were talking about him saying, look how he dressed. He looks poor, and he would hear all of this in his ear. But he was a uh, scholar. He, he got good grades. He didn't focus. This is staying on course. He didn't focus. Did it hurt him what people were saying about him? Yes, it did. But his focus was on, this was his focus. I'm going to have gold. I'm going to be rich one day. That's what he would always say when people would put him down. He went home one day. His dad was gone. And when his dad was gone, he wasn't sending money to the family. His sister was so hungry. She said, I'm so hungry. So that day in school, he was just sitting down there on the step, y'all. And he was sitting there because he was worried about them not having food. Some money fell out of this girl's um, pocket. And he got the money and he ran to her. She wouldn't say nothing to him. He opened the money up. It was $300. So as he opened that money up, he went to the grocery store. His sister had such a bad cough, the mama couldn't get her medicine. He went to the grocery store, bought grocery, got the medicine. The sister was there with blood coming out of her mouth. And the blood that was coming out of her mouth, she was saying, where's, um, she he said, mama went to give blood so she can get me some medicine. The friend said, she done gave so much blood, she's too weak to give any more blood. She come home, she said, I couldn't give no more blood because my veins had collapsed. The son had already got y'all the grocery and got the medicine for his sister. So later on, the son, you know, he's studying in his room, they're going through, and the mom got a letter from the husband and said, I'm divorcing you. I'm leaving you. I have another family. At that time, it broke the mom's heart so bad. She went into depression. She couldn't do anything. The, the son had to try to fend for the family. So the sister, he come home one night, he looked. There was one slice of bread and a little bit of uh, uh, peanut butter. And he put it on the bread just to eat. The sister come and she said, I'm so hungry. He said, eat this. He gave her the bread. Then she said, he said, eat this and tomorrow I'll try to get you some chicken. We'll eat chicken tomorrow. This man was washing dishes in the restaurant. The guy treated him horribly. He was emptying the plate. Somebody left a piece of chicken. He wrapped it up, put it on the shelf for his sister. The black guy came in, which was the manager. He said, what are you trying to do with food? Give it to your dog and threw the food in the trash. He just started crying because he knew his sister was hungry. He come home. Evidently, he took the chicken out the trash. He gave it to his sister. The mom, the sister took the chicken trying to feed her mother because her mother wouldn't eat. She had, was so depressed with the father leaving, she would not eat, she would not drink. The mother died of a broken heart, left the two children. So this young man was 18. He went to uh, get food stamps, toting his sister on his back wherever they went, got them food stamps for them to have food stamps. What he did, he moved out of the apartment they were in, moved in a smaller place, started saving his money, and every time he looked at his money, he said, I'm going to have gold. He met this girl that was very rich. She was the one that dropped the money and wouldn't take the money back. So when he met her, he said, that's my wife. And she liked him, but he wouldn't get involved with her because he had nothing. 
So finally one day when they met, he told her, he said, you're going to be my wife, and I'm going to get a lot of gold, and I'm going to take care of you. And she said, it don't matter how poor you are. And she said, I'm so sorry. I took your $300. She said, because I gave you the $300. I knew your situation. So that didn't bother me. The family, when they would come in the restaurant, and she'd be sitting there, and he'd be waiting tables, they say, stay away from him. Do you see how he looked? He hearing all of this. But his focus was, I'm going to be rich. I'm staying on course. So the, the more of the whole thing, I'm getting to the, the punchline. This guy sat there taking care of his sister. They did the best they could. He told her everywhere. He had a best friend, which was a black guy. He was selling drugs. And he said, man, he driving a Lexus. He tell him, he said, man, you don't have to live like this. Come work with me. He said, I will not. He said, I will not do something that's illegal to get money. He said, well, I'm telling you, you can come out of what you in if you work with me. He wouldn't do it, y'all. Then this guy, it got to the point that people start just looking at him so wrongly, but God would give him favor. He would give him bonuses at work. He would take that money. He would put it up. So one day, this is what happened. The, the sister, she began to grow up. This guy, finally, he said, okay, the restaurant owner told them, I'm about to shut down the restaurant. He said, my wife been sick. I can't do this anymore. And the black guy got mad. He said, how am I going to feed my family? This little dude, he ain't say one word. He began to pray. He began to seek the Lord. But before all of that, the girl's family sent her away because they began to fall in love. They began to go to church. They began to seek God. They sent her out of the country to get away from him. This boy went to her house every day. Finally, when he lost his job and didn't have anything, he said, I'm going to go take this in, this money, and get gold. He took it in. When he set it before the man, he said, you know what? It was low before you come in the door. Gold is at its highest now. This boy took what he had and bought the restaurant. I want y'all to hear it. Bought the restaurant that the man was selling. Hired all the employees back and told the man that was working with him, he said, everybody who come in here that don't have money, let them eat. He said, everybody that come in here that need a job, give them a job. So he set the whole thing up, and the man told him, we're making more money than we ever made money. He ended up buying 10 other restaurants. The girl's friend that put him down, that slapped him, and told him he'll never be nothing, he said, I got another application of somebody. He looked at the application. He said, I know her. He said, hire her for that other restaurant. He said, before you interview, he said, hire her, but don't let her know who the owner is. The girl found out that he was owner, and she said, I can't say nothing to him. He said, uh-uh. He said, it's okay. He said, I don't treat people like they treat me. This man ended up, young guy, just graduated, and guess what? He still went to college, even working those jobs. He stayed on course. Got all these restaurants. The man said, it's time for you to get you and your sister a place to stay and a car. He drove up, picked his sister up from school. She said, you got us a car like you said. They lived in a mansion, y'all. This man never liked money. He stayed the course. Guess who showed back up in his life? The dad. Dad showed up, told him, son, I don't have nowhere to go. Soon as my legs got cut off and I got on disability, my wife and children left me. He put him in his house, told him just to take care of the garden, took care of his daddy. The girl that he loved, that he was going to marry, found out she's coming back in town. She's marrying somebody else. This took him for a loop. Now, he still had gold. He holding on to the gold because every time God would tell him to take the gold up there, he would get a lot of money for it. This time, he took the gold, he threw it on the floor, he said, God, I don't want nothing but her because you said she was my wife. Come to find out when he finally got back up with her, they were talking on the phone. She got in an accident. They were not looking for her to live. She ready to get married, but check this out. She needed a kidney or she wouldn't make it. He ran to the hospital, gave her a kidney and said, don't say I done nothing. I don't want nobody to know anything. He gave her his kidney. The one that she was going to marry found out, and he said, you're more of a man than I am. This guy ended up marrying 
this woman. He stayed on course. He didn't let nobody distract him from what God told him. Did he get his feelings hurt? Did he get put down because of his clothes? Didn't have nowhere to go, but he stayed on course. What am I telling you young folks in here today? You're going to be put down with peers. They're going to say you, you're not this and you're not that. You'll never make it. But when you stick with the plan that God has for your life, when you stay on course, no matter what it looked like, no matter what it appeared to be, then you will be in the place that God has for you to be in. This is why he told in the book of Jeremiah 29, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you. Plans for good and not evil. For you to have an expected end. These people were in captivity. God said, even though you're in captivity, I'm in the midst of the captivity. You put yourself in captivity because you come out of the will that I had for you. He said, but why are you in this place? Build houses, have children, build, plant, because you're going to be here until I bring you out of this place. See, God is telling you that wherever he have you, wherever you plant it, wherever God has put you, whether it's on a job, whether it's in a marriage, quit telling people, this is my husband, this is my wife. But as soon as things get bad, you want to divorce. I don't want to be here no more. She done got too fat. What the fat have to do with God? Oh, he lazy, he ain't no good. No, you said that God said that's your husband. Now, if that's your husband, deal with the laziness. Deal with the no moneyness. Because you said God said it. Now, why you want to get rid of him or her? Because you feeling like they ain't doing what they supposed to do. You ain't honoring God because you said that's what God said. I am so tired of church folk saying God said something. Then when times get hard, they giddy up and go. If God said it, you're supposed to stick it out. But if you go get wise counsel and your pastor's telling you, nope. God said you ain't ready for that man and you ain't ready for that woman. Now they're ready to cut the pastor's throat. I'm the worst pastor ever because I tell them you need to wait a year. See what God got to say. No, that's my man. He loves me. He do anything for me. Then when you get married, he doing more for his mama he doing for you. My mama come first. You should have known you married a mama's boy. If you don't like it, go home. But you said that's your husband. You said God said that's your husband. So deal with that with the help of the Lord. Stay on course. Get into the word of God. Get into prayer and hear what the spirit has to say. Because if you know that's what God said, you don't change your mind because the situation changed. Don't, it's best for nobody in this place to get up and testify on what God said if you don't have a surety. Keep it to yourself and then you won't be made a fool of when you change. We got to stay on course, y'all. You got to hear God and do what God say and you will always come out a winner. Go in the word of God. Are we reading the word? Paul, all of them went through, but they stayed on course. They still preach what they believe. When they got beat, they still preach what they believe. They didn't change their mind. We got too many church people changing their minds because of people. God said, I change not. Whatever he said is that's what he meant. But some people are following carnal-minded folk and won't even take spiritual counsel. Then you get in trouble. And where you going then? Right back where you come from. Thank God for his grace and his mercy. That's why he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Even when you're weak, you're strong in him and in the power of his might. Stay on course. This man took him off course, this prophet. He sat at their table, and the Bible said this prophet lied. But he sat at the table. He began to eat with them, got his belly full. Then the word of the Lord come through the prophet. Say, you will die. Because you got off course. You didn't take me at my word. The man saddled up his horse, left, and guess what? He died. 
And the lion them was staying, sitting there right by him. So that same prophet went and got his body, and he knew this was a prophet of the Lord. The Lord had to prove it to this other man that he was a prophet. He did hear from the Lord, and the Lord did what he said he was going to do. What am I telling y'all today? It's too many off course. This is why you don't go into every place God ain't told you to go into. I don't care what kind of titles in front of people name. If God ain't told you to go in that place, don't you go. Because it'll take you off course and you will think this is what I need to be doing and God ain't told you that's what you need to be doing. Whatever God tell you is what God is saying. God is not going to change. This man end up dying because he got off course. Je um, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, 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 guess what they did? Korah was the head leader, taking leaders out of position because he wanted to be in Moses' place and God already gave him a place. He was a Levite. He already was working in the temple, but he wanted Moses' position. We got people in this house that want my position, doing it on the sly. Doing it on the sly. Trying to tell people something that I said wasn't correct. Oh, I'm speaking through the Holy Ghost. Listen to what she said. This is how it's supposed to be. Don't mess with God. Because when you mess with me, you messing with God. You better hear the Lord. God is trying to spare you from something. And if you ain't hearing warning today, I feel for you. If God wanted you where I was, he would have put you there. And he can't put you there because you in the way. And when you don't get there, you're ready to go. And then somebody puts you there and you end up dying where they put you. Because that's not where God wants you to be. There is an anointing that God places on people's lives to do what they do. If I didn't have this anointing that come from the grace of God, I would have quit a long time ago. You got to know how to deal with things, and God give you the grace to deal with it. Some of you ain't passed the material. How I know? You don't even pay your tithes. You want to preach, but you don't want to do what the Word tell you to do. Don't want to show up on time, but you want to have a congregation to say, I'm Pastor Tulu. Don't want to show up on time. Don't want to help in the church, but you got a call on your life. Oh, it's quiet up in here. God give you all this to help you. God called me to root it up, and I'm going to root it up. Once I root it up, I'm going to build it up so you can be planted. Some of you don't want to be rooted up. You want to be built up. But stuff that's down there got to be rooted up so you can plant some good seed. Don't, people don't want you to tell them nothing. You too young. You don't know what I know. I know what Jesus know. And Jesus said, ain't yet your time. Sit it down. Don't, ain't no explanation behind it. You can't even wash your dishes at home. You can't even feed your husband. I ain't even in your house and your husband is dying of hunger right now. Hmm, this is what's happening. But people behind the pulpit and left their house tore up from the floor up. If my husband hungry, it's because he chose to be hungry. Ain't because his wife ain't going to make sure he fed. Is that true, honey? He, he kind of low over there. Ain't he kind of low over there? I ain't hardly heard nothing. Did y'all heard anything? No more pork chop for you. I believe in doing it God's way. Not based on how I feel. Because y'all, this person right that's standing before you, I would have gave up years ago. I've been talked about. I've been ridiculed. I've been lied on. All of those good things. But the more God um, has developed me in him, I laugh. I laugh and I rejoice. I say, God, I'm doing a great work. And why should I? come down and God prepared me for that because he would tell people to tell me you like Nehemiah I said I'm so tired of people telling me I'm like a Nehemiah 
But when I start reading up on Nehemiah, I'm like, Jesus, Jesus. I know why now. Because I won't come down. If that's what God said, I don't care if I'm hated. I got to stay the course. Why? Because this is the direction that God has taken me in. Stay up under a person that you know that hear God. We, we sometimes we miss it. But if they're really wanting to hear God, they're going to go back in and say, God, come on, look at Joshua. Joshua took the word from God. They got off course, didn't they? And they got off course because it was sin in the camp. It wasn't because of Joshua. It was because somebody that was amongst Joshua brought sin in the camp. And Joshua had to pray and fast and say, God, why ain't we won this battle? That's what a leader does. That's my job. When I see the different leaders in here not doing what they're supposed to do, I got to back up and say, God, what's going on with Miracle Temple? What's stagnating Miracle Temple? Where is it? And then God will show me where it is. And then it's up to me to do what God tell me to do with what he showed me. When Joshua found out what it was, he called Achan in. And guess what? He had to get rid of that stuff. So what am I telling you? Don't be Achan. Don't be Korah. Don't be the ones that's trying to be seen, heard, and attached to. Get into your word and really hear God. And do what God is telling you to do outside of how you feel. The enemy is a trickster, y'all. And these days and times, he want to uproot people. He want people to be where God ain't told them to be. And that's when death come. Death don't have to be a physical death. It doesn't. Death can be around you while you're alive. And you can't do nothing. It, it comes through sickness. It comes through losing different things. Is it because God did that? No. You open the door for that to happen in your life. Don't be fooled. God is encouraging you today. Stay on course. If it's looking bad, stay on course. Because God is strengthening you even in the midst of the storm. If your money don't look right, stay on course. Hear what God has to say. Miracle Temple, if I did not stay on course, me and my husband depend on God. I can't depend on you. I love you. But if you tell me you're going to do something, I can't put my dependency on you. I have to trust the God in you. But I have to go on and say, God, what are you saying to me? And that's what we got to do. Stay on course. When the storm came, nothing was coming in the Miracle Temple, y'all. When church ain't going on, nothing is coming in the miracle temple. We walk by faith and not by sight. If I had not have stopped and said, Spirit of the living God, what do you want us to do at this time? How do you want us to do it? He told me what to do. I stayed on course. Amen. To me, it seemed like Jesse the Blandis, he don't know me. But I stayed on course. I heard God. And they sent us money overnight. I didn't ask you. Did I call any of you guys? No, I didn't ask. I never asked any of you guys. Keep your, my name out your mouth saying I'm begging for money. I ain't called your house and asked for nothing. If I have, record me and prove it. I ain't called you and asked you for not one quarter, not one dime. If I needed it, you would never know. Not even my daddy, and he's a witness. I don't even call daddy and ask daddy for money. He's a witness. How long you know me, daddy? <laughs> see, see? I don't call my daddy. From the time I was 15 years old, daddy, what was I doing? Working, buying cars. Never asked daddy. That's how I was raised. Clothes, blueberry field. That's how I was raised. See, God was raising me up to put me in position before I even knew about a position. Never asked. Because I was always independent. Didn't know why I was so like that in the area because God was preparing me for where he was taking me. Let him prepare you before you tell people that's who you are. Will you be able to stand where he put you? Through whatever come, you can stand. And doing all, you can still stand. It ain't about you. It's about him. Amen. It's about getting this gospel out. But I'm going to leave this with you. 
whatever anybody has said that's not of God, the same ditch or pit you made for me, you're going to fall in it. That's the word. Keep your mouth off of God's people when they're doing the work of the kingdom. Come on, they called Elijah ballhead. Them bears come out there and ate them cheering up. He was doing the work of the Lord, and they're going to call him bald. Look at old bald head. Them bears ate them up. Some of you being eaten up, and you still running your mouth. If you're in the word, you need to do what the word says. If you got alt, you need to come to the person you got alt with. Stay on course. This is your course. The word of God. And it'll keep you in check 24-7. You can't get around it. Because as soon as you open your mouth, you're getting correction. Sanctify us in truth. Thy word is truth. So I'm going to encourage you. If you're going through in your body today. And you've been in the word. And the word says. You are the healed. Of the Lord. By Jesus Christ, you were already healed. Healing is the children's bread. He sent his word and he has healed you. He has delivered you from your destruction. You stand on that. You honor God with that. Because that's his word. If anybody come to you and try to tell you, oh, you ain't going to be healed. A lot of people had that and they wasn't even healed. Say, the devil is a liar. Get thou behind. Get under my feet, Satan. That ain't what God said. This is what, do you think that if God gave you a word, he going to let you die in what he gave you, not let you want to die? God will let you know when your time is up. He let my granddaddy know when his time was up. Granddaddy say, it's time for me to go home now. His heart was prepared to be with the Lord. It didn't matter what they said or what they did. Granddaddy say, it's my time. And granddaddy went to be with the Lord. But other times when he was going through, granddaddy knew it wasn't his time. And he kept the course. He kept the faith. He fought a good fight of faith. That's what we're supposed to do. That's why you stay in your word. Hear the spirit. Don't listen to nobody else. What did he say? Shut the door behind you. And say, God, I only want to hear you and you alone. And it works every time. So keep the course. Don't get off course and know that God loves you. No matter what it looked like or what it appeared to be. This daughter back here, I get her name mixed up. She got that black hat on. Come up here, baby. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to say this openly. God said he will never, ever, ever leave you, nor shall he forsake.